I'm going to leave you with Mr. Chris Frederick Martin IV. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, how about the hospitality here? Right? Yeah. Yeah. This, is the, this is the kind of guitar store you want to hang out in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just go, hang out. You hope maybe they would buy something once in a while, but you sometimes do. But but that's part of what music stores are about is the hang. It's, it's just. And so I, I do wonder you know, about the internet, and you know, we can all buy stuff on the internet, but there's something about just coming to a music store, hanging out, being able to respectfully play some of the guitars. So I did this talk right before COVID at the store in Soho, and Diane and Claire were there. And I was on a roll. I don't know why. I was just in a mood. I guess because I was so close right, to the original American Guitar Workshop in America. And, and I, the, the Soho store is a little longer and narrower. And afterwards, we're going to dinner, and Diane and Claire were like, didn't you see us in the back? I'm like, no, what were you doing? They were like, cut it, Dad, cut it, enough. So I hope not to do that tonight. But it was the last talk I gave before COVID. And so I'm not unhappy that I talked too much, because I spent two years not doing this thing that I love doing, just telling you about my family's business. But it's really, you know, I can talk about guitar building, and I will, and I can talk about all the guitars, but Craig, what's it really all about? It's all about playing and listening, right? Building guitars. How are you all doing? It's not, nice to be here with you. My name's Craig Fancher, and... Uh, yeah. You used to call me a, a clinician, but uh, I guess that, that changed over the years. Now I'm a product specialist. And now I just go with the boss. He, we go out and just meet folks like you and we present these wonderful guitars. We have some really cool things to show and share with you tonight. And Chris asked me to open up with a song. So I'm playing the Triple O 40S, the Mark Knopfler model. I could pick from any one of these, but I picked this one. It's a Tom Petty song. this particular one because I love the 1 and 13 16th fingerboard width and the, and the wider string spacing down at the saddle. It's really great for my uh, sausage fingers here. Thank you, 
Craig. So when I'm done, I've got posters, I want me to sign one, I really got sound holes. They're, they're not really good coasters because when they get wet, they cup and they're terrible frisbees, but they're still good. <laughs> <laughs> and hot, hot, hot off the presses. Hutton's Guide to Martin Guitars, 1833 to 1869. Just, I just want to show you one of the pages here, just to give you a sense of what we're dealing with. Let me find one here. <laughs> How's your eyesight? <laughs> I mean, I, I have it here, I can't read it, but this is the new Bible. It's falling apart. But, uh, so this is a continuation of the Mike Longworth book, and I use this as a reference because I can't interview my ancestors. I wish I could. I had a, a moment where I spent time with my grandfather, I lived with him, but in hindsight, for all the questions I asked him when I lived with him, there were so many I should have thought to ask. So tonight is my interpretation of how I see my family's business and some people on the Martin Guitar Forum may question my judgment, but hey, I'm Mr. Martin. <laughs> So the cool thing about this thing we're doing now, and we did it in Nashville, and we're, we've talked about taking it on a world tour. I don't know if Thomas, if we put that in the budget or not. So oh, of course. I, I think there's, there's, so this is, it's Chris's life in a thousand prototypes. And there probably is. There's, a, there's hundreds of prototypes that were built during my career. Most of which are modern day examples of what my ancestors came up with. And so this is the first one I want to talk about because of course this is kind of the beginning. So imagine we're in Soho, right? So Manhattan's which way? That, which way? Yeah. That way, okay. So we're in Soho and I point that way and what I'm pointing to is 196 Hudson Street which is what? How many blocks away? Six. Six blocks away, right? So CF Senior apprentices in the family business of making furniture and for some crazy reason gets inspired by the idea of making guitars. And with the help of his father, he goes to Vienna and gets a job working for a gentleman named Johann Stauffer who had a workshop. So it wasn't just Johann, it was a shop. And I think that was the beginning of CF going, oh, if you have more than just the luthier, you can make more than one guitar at a time. If you have apprentices, you can make more than one guitar. So I think that was the beginning of him going, oh, I can do this more than once in a while. Ends up working for Mr. Stauffer for several years, leaves briefly, works with Mr. Cool which was an older gentleman that worked at Stauffer. They were like, hey, we're gonna break off and start our own thing. And the best thing that came of that was he married Mr. Cool's daughter, had a son, briefly goes back to his hometown of Mark Kirchen, and then decides to come to the new world. And when he comes, this is what he's sorta of kinda of making, right? Because this is what Johann Stauffer taught him to make. This is Stauffer high art guitar. And primarily because of this incredibly complex tuning mechanism. So we're talking about 1825. <laughs> Who made this thing in 1825? Dick Boke and I spent some time with a fellow named James Westbrook at the plant a couple years ago. And we're talking, we're in the museum, we're, we're in the first showcase. And we have a bunch of these. and, and James is looking at him and I go, what's the story with those? He goes, Chris, did you know that mechanism was half the cost of the entire guitar? So this was, a, again, a high art Martin guitar. Not all Martin guitars had this, but this is what CF knew how to make. And I am convinced that Leo Fender 
bank add some inspiration from that? Maybe, sort of, kind of, right? But what CF discovered was that people really didn't get it. They're like, wow, what's going on there? That's a, that's a odd duck. Because at that time, what people, and I think we talked about this earlier, what people saw in their mind was a very traditional Spanish classic guitar. That's, that was the guitar. That was, you know, when you saw an image of a guitar, it didn't have a stout or headstock. It was kind of a square thing. And, and so I, I don't think this, I think part of the problem was they came from Europe and they were expensive and, you know, the boat got delayed. He's like, well, I got a guitar, but no headstock. So he pretty quickly began to copy the Spanish style. What can you play on a guitar like this? Well, you can play anything. A lot of classical music was played on these styles of guitars. Uh, I play a lot of blues. I can play blues on this guitar. I believe those guitars retail are a wholesale for ten dollars in a day. So that means the tuning mechanism was five dollars. Sold. <laughs> you heard him say back in the day. Right? Ten, ten bucks in eighteen twenty-five. It was a lot, a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. A lot of money. Okay, so now CF realizes I need to copy the Spanish bill. And so he, he does and he doesn't, because he has this, you know, history of building furniture, and thank goodness. I mean, I, I've seen the Spanish technique. It's, it's fascinating when you think about it, that when a Spanish builder builds a very traditional Spanish classic guitar, right, they have a big chunk of wood down here. It's part of the neck, and they cut a couple of slots inside of the bottom of the neck, and they build the body around the neck. Yeah, complicated stuff. But the advantage of the dovetail is we can build, and you have to come visit the factory. You're two and a half hours away, you gotta come visit. We build the body and the neck separately. Thank goodness, I can't imagine having a factory where the entire thing's going through the factory this big. So CF's like, okay, I'm gonna copy the Spanish builders but I have to kind of make it look like I'm doing what they do. So one of the things that the Spanish builders do on the, on the there's a block here, right? And then they have this piece of wood that comes, it's, it's hard to see, but it's in there. It's called the Spanish foot. And it's like, oh, it's part of the integral part of the, the way they hold the guitar together and all that. And so this guitar, which is a reproduction of a guitar from somewhere in the 1800s, has a Spanish foot. That's fake. It has no purpose, but it looks nice. <laughs> so the, the thing that, and there's a book written about this, an entire book written about why on earth, if Mr. Martin is 
channeling Mr. Stauffer, and now honoring and worshiping the Spanish design, why did he move away from the traditional fan bracing? That, was it Mr. Torres, I think, that developed that? It's like, well, why would you move away from that? And we believe the reason was because he was making not only tie bridge guitars, which are very traditional and classic guitars, he was making <clears throat> pin bridge guitars. And the fan bracing and the pin bridge drilling I didn't always cooperate. And in fact, we have some interesting pictures of like, oh my goodness. So I imagine at one point he's like, oh, I have to take the top off because I drilled through the brace. This is terrible. So over a period of time, it's in this book and it's in the other book, the Peter Zago book, the evolution. It wasn't like he went home one night and he lived right next to the factory, so it wasn't a long commute, and said, tomorrow I'm going to reinvent how I brace the top. It happened over a period of time. But what ultimately happened was he invented what we call Martin X bracing. I think it was to get the darn braces out of the way of dribbling the hole through the top. For whatever reason, it was a great idea. Not only did it work through the entire time that we were making gut string guitars, when we transitioned to steel string guitars in the 20s, in the teens and the 20s, it really worked. And in fact, the vast majority of acoustic guitars made on earth either use Martin bracing or use Martin X bracing as a jumping off point to either say, well, I, put, I add an extra brace over here, and that's why my guitar is more valuable and sounds better. Or, and I mean no disrespect, you come up with A-frame bracing, which is the type of bracing we used to use on our archtop guitars. So A-frame bracing is not new. But anyway, so this particular guitar, which is a reproduction of what we believe is possibly the first Martin x brace guitar ever made. And this was made for a good customer, Madame Dagoni. She was not that kind of madam. That was a term of endearment for someone who was a very highly trained artiste. And Madame Degoni came to Mr. Martin, possibly through a relationship with a, with, a, with a dealer, and we don't know why, but Madame Degoni got the first Martin x guitar that we're aware of today. Now, someone may show up with one that predates that, but there you go. Until that happens, Martin's going to continue saying they developed the x -brace. This is a gorgeous little guitar. So all guitars of this time period, up till actually the late teens, early 1920s, were gut string guitars. Now we have nylon strings on this. The first guitar I played has steel strings, but the actual original in the museum from 
Hall, I've become kind of a student of family business. I get Family Business Magazine, and I've been to some conferences. And it's funny when you, you go to a family business conference and they kind of abbreviate. And you know, the founder, the founder's Gen 1. So sometimes at a family business, actually, you know, Gen 1 will be there, but because it's a multi generational, they're now older. So I, I remember going to one of those, you know, we're all out in the audience, and the, the speaker goes, you know, how many Gen 1s here? So that's the founder, but the founders are there with their kids or whatever. So, you know, a bunch of people raise their hand. How many Gen 2s? So Gen 2 would be CF Senior. And what I've read about family businesses is that generally the second generation, if they're smart, don't mess with the sauce. <laughs> Dad came up with something really cool in the garage, or mom came up with something really cool in the kitchen. Don't mess with the sauce. And that was CF Jr. He was smart enough. I don't think he would subscribe to Family Business Magazine at that time, but he knew that his job was to carry on. Dad came up with something interesting. Dad was inspired. Dad was an entrepreneur. If I'm smart, I just carry on. And that's what he did. He did a really good job. He was not an innovator. He was not necessarily very entrepreneurial, but he understood that there's something there. And if I just, you know, work it, don't break it kind of thing. So now the guitars are getting a little bigger. People are looking for a little more volume. But back in, in the day, the theory was that a good guitar should have a balance between bass, mid-range, and treble. And that's why classic guitars have the shape they do. That's why early Martin guitars have the shape they do. Even as they got bigger, the idea was even if we give the audience more volume, we give it to them with a balance. And that's something my family's done very well in that it, when they were looking to do that. And so this is a double O? Single O. Single O, okay. 12 fret, slot head, kind of fancy. It's the 45. Yeah. It's the thing. It was really the King 1930. This was what well, was today. It's an amazing guitar. I got to tell you a quick story. And some of you I know are aware of this story. But so Joan Baez had used her original uh, 045 for about 30 years. And somebody came up to her and said, at the time, you know, that guitar is worth about 100 grand. You shouldn't be taking it out on the road anymore. So she took it home, put it in her, her bedroom. And the person who told her that said, I have another guitar for you to use. So they, she started using another brand. Dick Bogue from Martin, our good friend, he tuned in one night, he saw Joan playing this other brand, Brand X guitar, and he was horrified because he knew what she had. So he contacts her and he says, Joan, what's, what's going on here? Well, that guitar's worth so much money, and it's in need of some repair, I'm, I'm just not going to take it out anymore. So Dick said, listen, we'll do any repairs needed for free. Just get the guitar to me, we'll take care of it. So they shipped the guitar to Martin, and Dick sent it off to the repair people, and he gets a call, and he says, come on, you got to see this. And he goes down, what, what could possibly be wrong? So the repair person shows them, puts the inspection mirror inside the guitar, and underneath, on the soundboard, was written, too bad you're a communist. <laughs> so he, the repair person was, was upset. He didn't want Joan to think that he wrote that, and he wouldn't make sure that Dick knew that he did know that. So apparently what happened was, the guitar had been repaired during the Vietnam era, and whoever did the repair has not come forward saying that I put... Now, it's from a mirror, so it's written backwards. And it's actually somebody really took the pains to write this thing backwards. And guess what? Dick tells Joan the story, and she just had a laugh over it. She was really... thought it was quite funny. So what does Dick do? In the middle of the night, he gets up, he has this, he has this vision. He says, we're going to do the same thing. 
So we made a label. So inside this guitar is a label with backwards printing saying, too bad you're a comic. <laughs> this is an exquisite instrument. Listen to that. Now, I don't do a whole lot. I don't do, I actually, I don't think I do any Joe Biden songs, but I do have a little a snippet of one. You'll remember this. The night they drove for deep sea down. Just, you know, go out and talk about these prototypes. We, Craig and I would go on the road, and what, you would bring one guitar yeah. with a pickup. What would you bring? What was the pickup? Because you know, here I, you're working with a microphone. I bring typically a, a triple O 2080C, one of the Clapton models. And you plug it in, and you're good to go. Right. What do you do when you don't have a pickup? Well, you do what we're doing here. And in the studio, of course, you all know that in the studio, uh, you're going to use a microphone, a good microphone, or two or three. I have yeah, what was that thing we did down in Montgomery? Yeah. Over at the, you, you had it over, over, over in the back. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. Cool. There yeah. were three mics, yeah. you know, a large diaphragm, a small diaphragm, and one over my shoulder. Catch those. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. But uh, then you're, you're situated like here. I can't walk around. I yeah, can't yeah. move around. Yeah. If I move, you see them come up adjusting, because uh, if I move a little bit, yeah. the sound changes. We do this next, but you started with this. We can do but you that can, again. You can, we, you can both tell this story, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Now, I'm gonna. Why don't you come up? You you start. How do you know Mark Knopfler? Come on, a moment, just a moment. And then try so Mark is a dear friend. 1979, just open well, open Rue 78. 79, actually we, we came downstairs to the main floor because um, the place upstairs actually was called the music stop before Ruiz. And then someone coming from Queens to say, I own the name. <laughs> a friend of mine said, for well, the Ruiz music stop. They come downstairs, uh, I was driving with friend uh, to 48, blasting Sultan swing. <laughs> I, never, I never heard a guitar playing. Do that with the fingers. I don't know what it was, and it was friend and I only working, and 
is in the office, 48. I'm in the front, and the first customer is this guy with a little thing. He said, Bills, AC, I think it was a book. The, in the English company, the uh, airplanes company. And I look, and it's Mark Nofflin. I was just, oh my God. I say, man, I was just blasting your song, man. I can't believe it, the way you play. Mark, Mark is, uh, is a shy, very shy guy. Totally the opposite of me. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I say, man, I can't believe it. I said, Fred, look who's here. This guy that play, played the, the, the song, and, and, and Saltero Swing. And, and I said, listen, it was February, my birthday in February 17. And I say, I don't have too many, I don't know too many people in New York. Do you mind coming to my house for my birthday? He said, well, I don't know anybody here either. I was, he was looking for a, 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 a studio to do the second album, album communicate. And he came, and it's funny, me in Argentina and him in, in England, we do have uh, somebody who I admire tremendously, and that is Hank Marvin from the group The Shadows. Everyone in England want to get a red guitar, including Mark. <laughs> and actually, the distributor from, from England had to paint all the guitars red. Summers wasn't selling. Me, the guitarist behind over there, I took it to a car guy and I said, paint it red. Why? I paint it red. I, I got a guitar. And, and, I, and I got the name Fender Stratocaster. I, I blew it there. I couldn't afford a Fender. And, and, and yes, and this was here in East Chester, that we used to live in Green Knolls over here. And I think if we drink about four or five bottles of wine, we ended up on the floor. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> My wife waking us seven in the morning. Said, "What are you guys doing there?" We're both gone. And, and from that moment, that we share these beautiful stories about who you like, who you listen to, we become like brothers. And Mark, of course, is one of the guys that Martin guitars designed beautiful guitars for him. And he uses, actually, I was with him a few months ago when we see Eric Clapton together. And so also Eric. But that's a, this is a model you guys made. Uh, two or three different models, no, for Mark? Two. two. One's two. A one is a dry nut, mm -hmm. and this one, which is an incredible guitar. Yeah. But that was the story. Please don't ask me anymore. I will be talking all night. <laughs> So I had, I got to tell you a short Rudy, or a short Rudy story, this is probably those two, uh, a Mark story. So Dick Boke and I are in London and we're doing a four day event in Center City. And on Friday afternoon, it's done and he says to me at lunchtime, come on, we're going to get a train. We went west of the city about an hour. So we went to British Grove Studios, which is Mark's studio. And we had lunch with Mark. Three of us sitting there, they have a chef on, you know, full-time chef. We had lunch there, and he is such the, the nicest gentleman, really genuinely uh, seems to be interested in you, looks right at you when he's speaking to you, wants to know all about you, and then he says, come on, let's go have a play. And inside, I'm going like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Outside, I'm trying to be really cool about everything, <laughs> you know. But uh, we went in and sat down, and really, really wonderful time uh, playing and talking guitars. It was just British Ghost Studios. If you really want to go make a great record, that's the place to go. So Mark has this album, Get Lucky, and I know you might have thought I was going to play uh, Romeo and Julia or something, which I can, but I, I really like this song. As I said earlier, I love this wide fingerboard. If you have large fingers, you're really going to like this, the fingers, uh, the spacing. Of course, you're going to have to find one used somewhere, but I'm sure Rudy's will get one in if anybody does. Better with my muscles than I am with my mouth. Work the fairgrounds in the summer. I go pick fruit down south. 
When I feel the chilly wind Where the weather goes I fall Pack up my traveling things And go with the swallow You might get lucky now and then I win some You might get lucky now and then Well, I always think it's funny It gets me every time What about happiness and money? Think about the bread line And I wake up every morning I keep an eye on what I spend I Gotta think about eating I gotta think about paying rent might get lucky now and then Oh, you win some You might get lucky now and then So the story I remember is Mark came to the factory and we're hanging out in the conference room that's not there anymore. And we had a great conversation about cars. Did you know he has a birdcage Maserati? Yes, he does. Yeah. How cool is that? And a 67 E-type silver with a oh. red interior. That's my car. <laughs> And the motorcycles? <laughs> and I do think there is a connection. You know, it's, it's mostly a guy thing, right? Mostly guitar collectors are guys. And there's a connection between like guitars and cars and watches. And you know, I'll get into the watch thing later. We need to do more car connection stuff, you know, right? Yeah, we, do. we actually we we talked to Ferrari. And they were so pardon me, arrogant, <laughs> that we stopped talking to him. But we did do some work with Porsche. There's a Porsche facility near the factory. I was in the Christophorus magazine. I'm kind of a Porsche guy, so we should do more cross-branding with car You're more than just kind of a Porsche guy. <laughs> yeah, that's <was pretty. laughs> So what's this? Okay, so now we're at a point in the history of the company where Oh, we should have brought some ball back mandolins. How good are you at playing the ball back mandolins? <laughs> but so now CF Juniors, he's ready to pass the baton on to Frank Henry. Do not ask me why Frank Henry was not CF the third. I don't know. I have no idea why he wasn't CF the third, but he wasn't. But and again, family businesses. So the third generation, that's where things can get wonky. Because by the third generation, the kids are like, oh, this is pretty cool. There's a lot of money flowing around. We were talking about that earlier with some families we know by the third generation. They're, they just like, their money's falling out of their pocket and they don't know what to do with it. Well, save it and reinvest it is my opinion, but, or you can just have floor seats at the Knicks, right? <laughs> so, see ya. Oh no. <laughs> There it is. <laughs> Who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> it's really hard to fix. Charlie Command. Anybody? Ovations? Oh, Anyone? Ovation. Anyone yeah, get the connection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would. All right. They, they were hard to make. Thank goodness they were redesigned with a flat and carved back and a carved top. Oh my God, they were hard to make. And at some point they had these ivory. Oh, and inlay. It was ridiculous. And so they were brought over by Italian immigrants. And they were a thing, and it was a banjo and mandolin orchestra thing. And, but what came out of that, the, the most important thing that came out of that era was the steel string. The, the research I've done said that there were attempts to make steel strings for guitars 
in the late 1900s and early 1920s, but the quality was very inconsistent. Whereas they had been making gut strings forever. Gut strings are a pain in the ass to make, but they had figured out how to make them. But when the banjo and the mandolin came along, with the volume, the string makers said, all right, we've got to pick up our game here in terms of quality. And the key about string making is good wire and good machinery and good quality control. It's, it's a very, the, the, the tolerances are ridiculously tight to get it right. And even today, it's a real challenge to get string wire. And I'll, I'll go off on a tangent, but I was talking to my colleagues about, go to the wire show. And I'm like, Chris, we go to the wire show and it's terrible. Why is it terrible? It's a wire show. We make strings. Yes, I know. We go into the booth and they see we're from a guitar company and they go, we don't want to do business with you. Why? Well, because we make wire. I know! You make wire! We want to buy wire! Nobody cares what our wire looks like but you. Our wire gets wrapped in plastic. It gets hidden inside a car. It gets hidden inside a tire. You guys are so picky about what the damn wire looks like, we don't want to do business with you. So we are beholden to a couple of really specialized wire vendors. But now, now with the banjo and the mandolin, the wire, the metal guitar string is becoming more consistent, more reliable. Okay, but that, that's not enough. For 100, 1833 to say 19... 23. I could be wrong. I'll have to look at the book later. <laughs> we made gut string guitars. Why did we switch? And we switched like that. So I'm having dinner with George Bruin. It's George and I in Nashville. And George loves sushi. I've hung out with George. George likes to talk. But I'm like, I know what I'm getting into. I'm going to do it. So I'm just, I'm there. I'm having dinner with George. We're hanging out. He's having a good time. I said, George. By the way, do you know why? Why on earth did my family's business transition from gut to steel strings so quickly? And I thought, all right, it's early in the evening. <laughs> I'm going to give him half an hour. And I have learned with George, the best thing is to like inter intervene in his monologue. And I've, I've, it took me a while to learn that, but I was in a listening mode. And I thought, okay, George is going to spend the next half an hour giving me the dissertation on why Martin switched from gut to steel strings. And he looks at me and he goes, Segovia. I'm like, huh. I have never heard him answer a question with one word. <laughs> All right, George, tell me more. He goes, Segovia came to America in the late, in the 20s, the teens of 20s. And... The, and, and I can't put on time tonight, but classic guitar quality wasn't as good as Martin quality in the beginning. That's why CF was successful. But the Spanish builders had picked up their game. They moved from Cadiz to Madrid, picked up their game, the quality was better. And Segovia basically said, if you want to play a fine Spanish guitar, you must buy a guitar from Spain. He moved the market away from us. Thank goodness the steel strings were there. So we put the steel strings on the guitars, and I'm sure the first couple of guitars blew up. We're like, okay, but it was still kind of, you know, it was kind of a classic guitar with steel strings, but, you know, maybe, maybe we're onto something, and if we aren't, we're going to go out of business because people don't want gut string Martin guitars anymore. And a vaudeville banjo player came to us. And he's like, yeah, this vaudeville thing is going, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of over. And I would really like to play the guitar, but when I go to play a guitar, I really appreciate you have steel strings, I like that, but it's still a classic guitar. It's got a wide neck and the fingerboard is flat, and I'm used to a banjo with a narrow neck, and I want to work my way up the fingerboard, and on, on a classic guitar, I bang into the body. Can't you just make me a Martin guitar with a banjo neck? That's what I want. Okay, I'll be back. So I don't know. Yeah, you know, we don't know w what the discussions were. I'm assuming there was a napkin somewhere, and they're drawing on a napkin, right? 
And the conclusion was, well, you know, we have this triple O. What if we took the triple O guitar and squared off the shoulders and we make this arch top guitar that's not selling very well, but that has a 14 fret neck. What if we reconfigure the neck body joint from the arch top to a traditional Martin dovetail, squared off the shoulders on a triple O, and made this? And so Perry comes back, and then we're like, yeah, what do you think? This is the best we could do. He goes, you know, he played it, and he's like, you know, that works. Oh my God. I'm so glad Perry Beckel came to visit. <laughs> <laughs> Story is that Perry wanted 15 frets clear of the yeah. body. So the Martin engineers came back and said, we can do 14 frets clear. <laughs> the song that I, when Mark Knopfler said, what would you like to play? I said, can we do I'll See You In My Dreams the way you and Chet did it on the Neck and Neck album? Okay. He's like, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, Craig, here's an esoteric question. Who was the vaudeville ukulele player that was, he was just ridiculous. I forget. Yeah, I know. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? So just a moment about the ukulele. Talked about the mandolin. One of my regrets, and it's just, you know, it's too late now, is when we got out of the mandolin business, we were making mandolins for mandolin and banjo orchestras. And then the Depression comes, and then World War II. I do wonder, I do wonder if Martin had paid more attention to the bluegrass market, if possibly you might see a Martin mandolin in a bluegrass band. So I've asked, I've asked like, you know, I go down south and I ask like, hey, you know, what if we came up with a Martin mandolin for bluegrass? And they go like, well, Chris, that's fine. Don't reproduce anything you ever made. Oh, okay, what should we make? A copy of F5. <laughs> Never mind. All right. But the ukulele, we, I think, are the oldest ukulele manufacturer on earth that is still in business. How about that? <laughs> Not as sexy as a guitar, I know. The band comes and goes recently, been a bit of a ukulele boom. I think they're cool. I'm not going to ask you to play one tonight, <laughs> unless you want to. I don't know if it's, if it's tuned up. Yeah, no, we won't. It's tuned. Oh, OK. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> And there's up, you want to do this one or one of the others? This is HPL, but I think it's cool. That's fine. 
Someone else who played the ukulele. Someone will think of it. Tiny Tim. I was going to say Tiny Tim. Well, that would have been oh, that's no. much okay. later. Funny story. We have one of Tiny, <laughs> one of, one of Tiny Tim's ukes in our museum. And, you know, we know how often we are so happy as guitar vendors when a guitar hero inspires a generation of people to buy a particular guitar. Tiny Tim, at the height of his career, did nothing for the demand for ukuleles because nobody wanted to be Tiny Tim, right? If everyone wants to be Eric Clapton, no one wanted to be Tiny Tim. Also, it is the gateway drug to the guitar. Pete Seeger's first instrument, ukulele. Jimi Hendrix's first instrument, a one-string ukulele he found in the garbage. How about that? You sure got a line out of one string? Yeah. <laughs> More than I could. Are you going to play any Hendrix tonight? I plan on it, but I could. All right. Yeah. Okay, so what's significant about this? Well, it's an artist model, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Who's this? Judy Collins, right? That's the Judy Collins. We had talked about bringing the Major Kilikai. And there's a whole chapter in this book about Major Kilikai. There's an exhibit at the, what's the museum in Honolulu. My friend Kylan is obsessed. Kylan is obsessed with the connection between Major Kilikai, a classically trained Hawaiian musician, and the ultimate development of this guitar. And so far, we have to agree that, yeah, Major Kilikai may have ordered something that really was the beginning of the Dreadnought guitar. But again, we don't know. You know, there's no, we can't go back and interview them, but when we put the pieces together, it's like, huh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. So you can look up the Major Kilikai guitar. We've made some prototypes of that. It's actually a new model. Um, it will find a niche. It was kind of quirky. The Major Kilikai bridge is not my taste, but that's what he wanted. So that was a connection between Martin and Major Kilikai and his classical Hawaiian band and Ditson. Ditson was a chain of music stores, primarily located on the East Coast, and they were a big customer of Martin because they had a chain of stores and they knew that, you know, having the Martin franchise and staying connected to the Martins and, and talking about special instruments was commercially important because they, uh, they understood that, hey, this is a prestigious brand, we're a prestigious vendor, retailer, and we could do some cool stuff. And so we actually have ukuleles in our museum that look like dreadnought guitars, made for Ditson. And so, out of that major Kilikai, we come up with what the D1 mm -hmm. and the D2, made exclusively for Ditson. Pretty much this shape, right? It's kind of, sort of a classic guitar. It's called a bass guitar when we first introduced it, but it's 12 fret. But it would have been a slot head. Slide head. Or a solid head. No, both. A slot head. Mm -hmm. And they did not sell very well because people didn't know what to make of them. They were used to 
everything Craig had played before this. And they're like, this thing's big. It's, it doesn't have a balanced sound. It's overly bassy. And I'm like, okay, all right. Well, Ditson won something. Ditson went bust. The depression comes. They get they go bankrupt, and we get rid of all the Ditson models except for this one, and we put the Martin name on it, and it didn't sell very well because people didn't know what to make of it. It's like, what is that thing? And then the Singing Cowboys came along, and they understood it wasn't it, part of it. Is obviously Craig the volume, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also, particularly when we get into the 14th fret dreadnought, there's just something very imposing that you know when you see a musician walk up to a microphone holding a Martin dreadnought, you're going to expect something to happen, right? I mean, that's that's why musicians wear guitars, right? They wear them. Powerful, yeah. They wear them like clothing. That's why I, I don't. To, for the life of me, I cannot understand why anyone likes those gaudy Gibsons. But I mean, if that's the look you're going for, it works, right? So this is a 12 fret dreadnought, which is an old guitar, but this is a new version. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so this is that, as Chris mentioned, this is the Ditson style, the shape, like the sloped shoulders. So it wasn't until 1934 that they squared the shoulders off here and made a dreadnoughts with 14 frets clear. So the one we talked about, the OM28, the peribactyl model, uh, that guitar preceded this guitar. So once that was done, squaring off the shoulders, yeah. like these guitars hanging over here, isn't that about the most iconic look of a guitar? When you visualize an acoustic guitar, yeah. That's pretty much what comes to most people's minds, is that, and Martin is responsible for that. Listen to the bass on this one, like Chris said. So I'm sure Judy Collins has a lot of records out there, and you know she was right down here in the village. But it wasn't until 2022, this year, that she put out her first CD of all original music. That being said, I'm sure she played this song somewhere through her, uh, throughout her career. beautiful guitars, you know? <laughs> we'll get back to Dreadnoughts in a minute, but 
this is a it's a it's an arch top. Yeah, it's started out as arch top guitar. Um, we got into the arch top business a little late. Why didn't we carve the backs? <laughs> what were we thinking? Right? We took a basically a Martin guitar and put an arch top on it, thinking that the world would think that was a great idea. They didn't. <laughs> but so it was John Lundberg, I think, out west, and Matt Umanoff, we talked about Matt earlier, yes. and David Bromberg, who said, that shape's kind of compelling. That shape of Martin guitar is compelling. The arts top is a ridiculous thing that Martin should have never done, but we wouldn't have made this shape if we hadn't made the arch top. So they took the arch top Martins and ripped the arch top off yeah. and put a flat top on. Hmm. And so there were several prototypes, actually back in the day, uh, that David had done. And the, for at least two, possibly three, when they did, as Chris said, they took an F series, either an F7 or an F9 arch top guitar, and put a flat top on. The very first one was one that came into Matt's, uh, Matt's shop, and uh, somebody had put a plywood top on the, on the guitar. So they rebuilt, they ordered a top from Martin, they got a D28 style top, and they put it on that guitar. But the first couple prototypes, they actually used the existing short scale neck. And what David wanted was, they took a D28 neck and they put it on. That's a long scale. So the short scale is 24.9 inches. Long scale is 25.4 inches. So the long scale gives you a little more projection. Short scale, easier to bend your strings. Uh, so David felt that and feels that the perfect match is the long scale neck with this body size, which came from like a jumbo size, but it is a triple O depth. And then so the body could be all four of them. Yeah, that's it what it is. Continues that it, it's, idea of that. Shape. Yes, yeah, the four. It became known as the four O, or very commonly the M. Yeah. So that's what this is. It's a, this shape with a triple O depth. So it gives you a really great bass, but not too much. presentation. I really... We'll yeah. I really... <laughs> so, have you, I don't, have you ever played any of Eric Clapton's music? <laughs> 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 so, we could do the whole night of just that. Yeah. 
All right, so I'll just I'll dish a little bit about when I take over, right? I'm CEO, and what are the salesmen saying? We need artist endorsements. Everyone else is doing it. I'm like, yeah, but how do you do it with respect? Respect to the artist, respect to the brand. I wrestled, I wrestled with it for a while. I thought, all right. And there's a, a long story about Gene Autry, and, and that was the first artist model. But the, the theory in my mind was, if, if you, the artist, and we, the company, are at that point in our relationship, you, the artist, are already pretty famous. And you're already pretty wealthy. And I thought, you know, how inspirational is it to give someone who's wealthy the opportunity to have more wealth? Eh, eh maybe. I mean, some, I'm sure there's guys on Wall Street like, bring it on, more is the better, right? You know? But I thought, I wonder if these artists would warm up to the idea of, so the deal is with the artist model that you're at a point in your career that we're talking because you love Martins. We don't talk if you don't love them. So you gotta love them first, right? You can't come up to me at a trade show and go, Mr. Martin, I would play your guitars if you gave me one. It's like, no, nah, it's not how it works. <laughs> but if you love Martins and you're famous, and we're famous, we should talk. So that's where the conversation starts. And it's like, well, how does this work? Well, you're gonna help design it. Well, I don't know much about it. Your guitar tech's gonna help. So it's, sometimes it's the artist, sometimes it's the tech. We come up with a model. Now what? Well, you get one. Oh, I get one. Well, yeah, you're famous. Of course you get one. Anything else? You get to buy some for your family and friends at a very nice price. Really? Yeah, that's how the deal works. And then what? Well, we hope to sell some more. Yeah, and then what? We're going to take part of the proceeds from those sales and give it to your favorite charity. And they're like, huh. I like that. And so this is one of several guitars we've done in cooperation with Eric Clapton to support his charities. So the story behind this, this is the Navy Blues. And uh, let's see, 181 total guitars were made in this series. But what happened was Eric was on tour with a very special custom shop blue guitar. And it was slightly different from this, but he designed the, the rosette and some of the other inlays and the has herringbone that you can see when you look at it closely. With uh, Hiroshi Fujiwara, who is a guitarist and a designer from Japan. And they came up with this beautiful rosette. Now, this might be hard to see, but... So, the original design that he had, the rosette goes all around, and there's a radius here on the fingerboard, so you don't cut off the top of it. But the production model, really, it would have been really expensive to do that. The production model is squared off like this. But the big thing about this is Eric is a traditional triple O player. I mean, there's like nine, ten models. They're all triple O's, including his old instruments, his triple O 42s and things. This, uh, this guitar was made as an OM, by mistake. And they that didn't... never happens in the diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, you know. Anyone who that, it never happens. No diamond. mistakes. Like no mistakes. <laughs> It was a happy one. It ended up being a very happy one. They were supposed to build a triple O. They built a, a, an OM and sent it to Eric, and he loved it. He loved the protection, said, go ahead with it. The very first color that they sent was uh, a royal blue. So he sent that back and said, can you make a little deeper blue? And that's Which what takes another three color. months to do. To, to do the color. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to make a new guitar for it. Uh, We're ready to go. He's like, ah, everything's good with the color. Oh, no. <laughs> so that's what we have. It's, uh, it's an Alpine spruce top. It has the balance of a triple O or an OM. I'm going to do 
something for you here. Let's see that you may not know. It's a it's a Clapton strong, uh, song. Let's see here. It's from the Unplugged. to celebrate making two million guitars. So we go back to, how, how did I, I just remember how this worked. I think my colleagues were like, let's do a watch thing, right? Because watches and guitars, and people are like, um, like, yeah, go for it. And my cousin Robert, you may have seen some of his work. Um, he, 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 very good. In fact, I'll, the funny story is we did the D420 after, yeah. after California legalized marijuana. <laughs> and and we have, we're, I'm so proud. Robert's work and just the idea that we can, you know, make a social statement. And so I'm on one of the forums. And the question was from someone who thinks they know more about my business than I do. Who was the idiot at Martin that thought this was a good idea? And who was the terrible artist that drew that art? I would go, well, that's me and my cousin Robert. <laughs> Good for you. So anyway, so we're working on this watch guitar, right? And then we had some conversation with Roland Murphy. Roland is, he's about my age. And in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, they used to make watches. They don't anymore. But Roland, as a young man, was inspired by that heritage and went to Switzerland and learned how to make watches by hand and came back to Lilitz, where is in Mount Joy, and decided to make watches by hand in the Swiss way. And so we're talking to Roland, and it's like, yeah, we're in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, we should do something together. It's like, yeah, we're working on this watch thing, you should come up. 
So I wasn't there, but apparently Roland comes up, and Robert, my cousin, had done the drawings for the watch guitar that we were working on before Roland. And Roland comes up, and they put, Robert wasn't there, but they, you know, Tim Teal, and, and they put the, the drawings out, and Roland's like, wow, those are really good technical drawings. Who did those? And Tim goes, oh, it's Chris's cousin Robert. And Roland goes, there's no kids here, right? <laughs> Roland goes, Robert doesn't have a fucking clue how a watch works. <laughs> so Roland and Robert went back to the drawing board. And that's what they came up with. So. Pretty cool. I mean, talk about guitar art, which I just, I like the intersection of guitar and art and music and I've always been a big proponent of art guitars. In fact, Robert and I did a talk in New Hope at an art gallery. That was fun. Does this work, Craig? Does it work as a guitar? Or is it just, is it just a wall hanger? These are the titanium strings. They are. <laughs> Seem to come and go Yeah Gypsy flies from coast to coast Knowing many love enough Bearing sorrow, having fun Back home it'll always run Sweet Melissa Yes, I know it'll always run Sweet Melissa date today? November 9th. November 9th. I was so looking forward to being here tonight with this because on November 6th, 1833, C.F. Martin Sr and family arrived in New York City. So you need to come up. We're gonna be done shortly. I'll take a couple questions. I'll be here, Craig will be here. You need to come up and check this out. On the pick guard is Lower Manhattan. Which is pretty, that was New York in 1833. That was New York. Above that it was farms and woods and yeah. There's a little ruby here. That's 196 Hudson Street. That's the original location of the Martin Guitar Workshop in the New World. In 1839, my family moved to Pennsylvania, and we've been there ever since. This thing here, this, I always have to look. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> That's the night sky, the day the ship landed on November 6, 1833. Yeah, I don't have much more to say. You want to do one more and then we'll...
Sure. See if there's any questions or anything. And Craig, thank you so much. Well, how about Bob Dylan? Is that a yes or no? Must a man walk down before they call him a man? Yes, and how many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? Yes, and how many times must cannonballs fall before they forever bend? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. I'm done. You're done. We're going to be here. If, if you want to ask any questions now that we could all benefit from the answer, that would be cool. Because what does happen often after I say, thank you for coming, and I ask if there's any questions, nobody asks any questions now, and I thank you for coming, and everybody lines up and asks me questions. <laughs> so now's your chance. Come on, somebody. All right. Would yes. You take yes. There was a... Uh, a movie called... Oh, no. 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 You know where I'm going. I know where you're going. Hatefully, I know where you're going. The, 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 the guitar that yeah. is supposed to be... Uh, yeah. Is yeah. that true? Is that really true? Well, all I know is we have a box of guitar parts okay. that we're not sure what to do with. Say no more. There are a lot of stories no about more. it. What I will say is we do not lend guitars to movies anymore. Good. Ever again. Yes. Never ever again. Oh, wow. <laughs> we will gladly so make you a reproduction. Let's, let's get this that's what time. that's what that's these not. are. We can make you a reproduction, but yes. no, we're not yeah, lending you a guitar from the museum so you can no, smash it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just curious, I'm actually an astronomer. Is is that the accurate star pattern from that night? Yes. According to the internet. I would say, right? We have records going back. There. According to the internet, yes, I would say it is. Yes. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Would you take a hundred bucks cash for it? <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> we have to raffle time. off this guitar tonight. The tickets are a million dollars a piece. We have to sell, we have to sell three. <laughs> but think of the odds. Think of the odds, right? <laughs> Yes? What does the prototype of the future going to look like? Oh, I can't even imagine. Good question. I, so I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in terms of... Can you hold this for me? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, was, I can't remember where I was. Probably a trade show. And, you know, I'm pretty accessible at trade shows. And a guy comes up and he goes, Mr. Martin, can I tell you what I think about your company? And I'm like... Well, you're about to, so yeah, go for it, right? And he said, I think Martin Guitar has one foot planted firmly in the past. And I'm going, yeah, can't, I can't argue with that. And he said, I think Martin Guitar has one foot planted firmly in the future. And I'm like, I'll take that. I don't know, but I think what I have found in my career, that if we stray too far from who we are, the market doesn't appreciate it. So I, I think anything we make in the future, you'll be able to say, I see the DNA there. Because I think that's what you all want. But, uh, you know, I, I have been very unsuccessful at inventing new Martin guitars. And I wish I had had more success. All of my original ideas were pretty much failures. I don't know why. I'm not going to give up. Keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> but I've also learned to kind of mine the history and the heritage along the way. <laughs> yes? What about your CEO models? They were 
They're great. CEO oh, so that's a good story. Okay, the CEO models. Because some, someone I know is working on one right now. So that came about because I would, once I realized that, Chris, your job is not to redesign everything on a Martin guitar all at once. Your desire, job is to kind of, you know, encourage people to do what they do. And yes, I, had, I have an idea. And it wasn't... But at that point in my career, I'm like, no, I think this idea might sell. My, my, my abject failure was the 728. That was just a, a, a terribly unsuccessful idea of mine. So now, but I'm, now I'm a little more, okay, I'm not going to color outside the lines. So I have this idea, and I socialize it with my colleagues. And you go, oh, that's a great idea, Chris, but if we added this to it, and you go, oh, if we added this and this, and you would go, if we added this and this and this, and we added this and this and this and this and this, and by the time it, time it came around the other side of the room, I didn't recognize it. So that's what the CEO models were. It's like, let's not make this so different than Chris's idea that he doesn't recognize it. But I do ask for input, because I know by myself, I can get it really wrong. Yes? If you had to describe to a novice in acoustic guitars who Martin is as an organization and how it compares to all these other guitar players, yeah. what would you tell them? You know, we were kind of the original. You know, a lot of people copy us, and, and I'm okay with that. But why would you buy a copy? Why would you buy a copy of a Martin guitar? You, you have some really cool, cool guitars here that aren't copies of anybody's work. I respect that, but when I look at something often that costs more than a Martin, and it looks like a Martin, I scratch my head and go, who would buy that? Why would they buy an overpriced copy of a Martin guitar? Just my opinion. You also have all the musicians that we all have loved through the ages played Martin guitar. Right. So you can always tell them that. that yeah. <laughs> Chris, how the weather changes all over the world yeah. affecting oh, the woods? I know. I think in the short term we're going to be okay. Because the old trees, there's still old trees out there. Whether those trees will be able to regenerate, and it's going to take 50 years. I know, that's what so, and we talk about this at work. Yes. We worship rosewood, and we worship mahogany, and we worship ebony. Black ebony! We worship black ebony, not striped ebony. We got to get over it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask that because uh, I had a little one from the 60s that was Brazilian. Yeah. Now we know East Indian. Yeah. Is, is that coming? We have different opinions even at work about how long these woods are going to be available. I'm pessimistic about the future of always being able to get bounteous quantities of these rare, exotic, tropical hardwoods. There are other woods, there are other materials that you can make a nice guitar out of. We are kind of bound up in our history and our tradition. I'm not. Some of my colleagues are more bound up in it than I am, to be honest with you. I'm over it. It's not that I don't like them. I have a daughter. She's 18. I can't say to Claire, you have to worship these traditional woods or else. I have to say, go for it. If it works, go for it. Good. Yeah. How far ahead do you buy wood? You know. Oh, that's a good question. It came, it, it, we're doing better because we're so, just so bigger than we ever were that we really need a wood bank. We almost ran out of ebony a couple of years ago. And I said to my colleagues, I said, this is kind of an important wood, isn't it? Oh, yes, Chris, it's very important. Well, how did we run out? Well, we ran out. No, I didn't ask. I said, how did we run out? We didn't have enough. Okay. Let's buy more. Let's put it in the wood bank. We, knew, we do now have a strategic wood reserve. It's not cheap. 
you got to keep it, you know, take care of it, climate control, but it gives us some cushion if they're, well, heaven, no, there's been no supply chain interruptions recently, so nothing to see here, right? So that, that's part of it. But the other part is to look at new, new woods and new materials. And it's, for me personally, it's really a challenge because I'm surrounded by people that love the grand tradition. And I do too, honestly I do. But like I said, I'm over it. If, I, if, that's, if that's what the future of the company is, I should sell the company. It's not the future of the company. The company is the traditional woods and more. That's the future for all guitar builders anywhere on earth. Yeah. Are you building woods with those those uh, cars with those woods not a test? Not so enough. Right we're not sound. we're not building enough of them, in my opinion. But to see if you can emulate the sound of like a deep. See, don't don't get caught up in that. That wood's going to sound like that wood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We will always put the D forty five on a pedestal. But when it comes to like a D15, a D15 could be made out of brown wood. It's gonna work, I think. And if it doesn't work, we won't make it. But again, we're, we're oh, it's gotta be mahogany. It's gotta be Honduran mahogany. Well, there's no more Honduras mahogany. Well, maybe Cuban mahogany. Well, there's no more Cuban mahogany. <laughs> yeah. It's all the fingers, man. Who's playing? I know. What I, I often say, Here's a prototype, put blindfolds on and tell me what you think. Right? It sounds great. And you take blindfolds, oh, it's hideous. Oh, that's not traditional. How did it sound? Oh, it sounded great. How's the quality of the, of the construction? Construction's fine. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like the way it looks. I think I've had one more question. All right. Yes. Are there alternative ones you're looking at right now? Absolutely. Absolutely, positively. We just internally have to become more open to embracing them, in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I love you. And believe it or not, you can play any of the guitars we brought tonight. Really? Okay. Any of the guitars we brought tonight. I don't care. Just be careful with that one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the gentleman standing in the doorway there, that's Thomas Ripson. Thomas is the president and CEO of Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry's back there, Lenny Pates in Nashville, Mike is back there. We have a number of people from Martin here, so and thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to Ruby and the entire staff. Yeah.